I'd like to express my thanks to Helen and the New York Academy of Medicine for organizing this timely event. I also like to take this opportunity to express my deep appreciation to the many participants who have worked so hard to increase public awareness of risk of Fukushima. The realm of nuclear science must be linked to political action. So we are here today. <laughs> I have worked at the United Nations and other international organizations in London and New York for 40 years. And I have organized, attended many international conferences, starting with the UN Population Conference in Bucharest, Romania in 1974. Over the years, we have discussed in public, private, what you might consider the defined issue of the 20th century. Population, environment, social economic issues, disarmament, women, children, and democracy. But we never discussed how one accident in a nuclear power plant could affect our lives for several hundred years, or how we lack a permanent nuclear waste repository one that could store our spent fuel rod for 100,000 years. Discussion to polit political system and the human right now seems short-sighted. When compared to potential nuclear disaster, that could affect our descendant, perhaps, 20,000 years. 20,000 years. 20,000 years ago, humans were building tools in the Stone Age. Can you believe? I worry about the growing risk to children who are being continually exposed to radiation. Many of the children will suffer from infectious diseases, and many will develop thyroid, lung, or threat cancer, breast cancers, sometimes in their lives. According to Helen, over one million people have died of these diseases as a result of Chernobyl accident. Others here have said that Fukushima so far has emitted more radiation than Chernobyl. In my two visits to Japan last year, I asked the party leader I met their thought on the unstable state of the reactors and the thyroid cancer risk in the children. Few had any idea of the spent fuel rod or of their high level of radiation or they sat 100 feet up in a damaged structure. Fewer still were thinking about public health. Undoubtedly, some politicians are aware of the potential catastrophe or reactor number four. However, they showed their surprise when I told them that reactor number four has 10 times more season, 137, than Cher Chernobyl released. 5,000 times what Hiroshima bomb released seven decades ago. They couldn't hide their shock when I told them that all of the spent fuel assemblies at Fukushima Daiichi contain 85 times more season than Chernobyl, and 50 to 100,000 times what released on Hiroshima. 
I thank Bob Alvarez for making these important calculations. I knew we had found the right message when we shared the article on our blog. It was read more than one million times in just a few days. These same politician le leaders wonder why they had heard none of this from TEPCO. Last April, Ambassador Morata and I met with Osamu Fujimura, who held the powerful position of Chief Cabinet Secretary. He assured us he would convey our message to Prime Minister Noda before he met with President Obama on April 30th. Both leaders might have discussed Fukushima at their private meeting, but the idea for independent assessment team and international help for the disaster were not mentioned publicly. This was a mistake. The government's first responsibility is the security of its citizens. But instead of reaching out to the independent scientists, they only consulted the TEPCO, focusing on minimizing the public fall relation fallout instead of nuclear radiation fallout. In any country, government and the industry will keep sensitive information close after disaster. But Japan's actions have been near autocratic. Because of the government unwillingness to share accurate information, Japanese citizens must rely on scrutinizing press corps for any useful information about the accident. Unfortunately, as with the politician, I found the journalists in Japan to be complacent and clueless. There is an amazing disconnect in Japan between the reality of Fukushima and the fictional image of the public has in mind. The press has failed in their job to close this gap. Japanese reporters, with several exceptions, have refused to investigate or ask the hard question about Fukushima. The New York Times Tokyo Bureau Chief Martin Fuckler provide a through look at the media club mentality and the aversion investigation in his excellent book, Credibility Lost, The Crisis in Japanese news media, uh, Newspaper Journalism After Fukushima. I think you should read this. To be sure, the government has not made their job easy. Typical says, when and what information will be released, like when the site would open to the press, when the long video of accident would be released. The accuracy of government medical report is in question. But without anyone to ask those questions, the public is left behind smoke screen operating on half truth. The public has lost sight of the most urgent need with regard to Fukushima. Its effort to end nuclear power in Japan are inspiring, but missed mark. The protests are a result of fear, frustration, uncertainty. Prime Minister Abe will guide Japan forward with continuing dependence on nuclear energy. He will continue to restart Japan's nuclear reactors. Of all the politicians I spoke with, he was the least receptive to my message of the danger for the country's children or of reactor number four spent fewer rod. I feel sad that we must wait for the sacrifice of tens of thousands of children to come to light for the public to realize disaster at hand. I am surprised 
that one group has not taken forceful action. Spiritual root of Japan sit firmly with respect for the natural environment. The Shinto Buddhist influence in Japanese life have bestowed a secret importance on the country's natural beauty and resources. Japan's environment has not known a bigger threat than the presented by the four damaged reactor at Fukushima. The country's spiritual leaders should be active in reinforcing the country's concern toward ongoing risk. We can see that Japan is ill-equipped to handle the ongoing problem of Fukushima. But this is more than Japanese problem. It has and will affect all of us. Are we doing enough? For the past two years, I have been warning of the potential catastrophe of reactor number four and the cancer crisis awaiting for our children. There are four major areas of concern that could cause a bigger disaster. Number one, in reactor number one, number two, and number three, complete core meltdowns have occurred. Japanese authorities have admitted the possibility the fuel may have melted through bottom of the reactor core vessels. It is speculated that this might lead to unintended criticality, resumption of the chain reaction, or powerful steam explosion. Either event could lead to major new releases of radioactivity into the environment. Number two, reactor one and three are site of particularly intense radiation, making those areas un approachable. As a result, reinforcement repairs have not yet been done since Fukushima accident. The ability of these structures to withstand a strong aftershock earthquake is uncertain. Number three, temporary cooling pipes installed in each of the crippled reactor pass through rubble and debris. They are unprotected and highly vulnerable to damage. This could lead to failure of some cooling system, causing overheating of the fuel. Further fuel damage with radioactive releases, additional hydrogen gas explosion, possibly even zirconium fire, fuel melting within spent fuel pool. Number four. Reactor number four building and its frame are seriously damaged. The spent fuel pool in unit four with a total weight of 1,617 tons is suspended 100 feet or 30 meters above ground. Typical plans to remove the spent fuel rot in the coming years, but if there is another massive earthquake nearby, this may not be fast enough. If this pool collapses or drains, the resulting blast of penetrating radiation will shut down the entire area. These plants represent unprecedented international security risks. I view this as the problem for human civilizations. Have I been overestimating the potential catastrophe? Your calculation tell me there is much higher probability of another disaster than one might think. So why are we allowing ourselves to take such a large risk? Allowing our future depends solely on chance or goodwill of TEPCO or Japanese government. And if another earthquake 
and the further meltdown are indeed possible at Fukushima, I must ask what so many Japanese leaders ask me, why does the United States stand by silently? It's in the United States' interest to take public action. High quantity of radiation reaching the West Coast would ruin our food crop. Geopolitical tension that would arise after such a disaster in swing evacuation would strain already difficult relations in East Asia. And finally, we are vulnerable to similar threat at home. A similar disaster could happen in the United States or elsewhere in the world with a nuclear reactor or temporary spent fuel storage facilities. There are more than 400 nuclear power plants online today, more than 100 of which are in the United States. Several sit near fault line. Others are old. And then there are the 24 temporary spent fuel storage facility holding rod like those suspend, uh, suspended above reactor number four. Many are only warehouses. Building a nuclear power plant might be rocket science. But maintaining the function of a cooling system is not. Yet these systems are so delicate and prone to failure. As we have seen in the last month at Fukushima, something as simple as a corrosion of a pipeline can set off meltdown. It is a time we regard nuclear power plant and storage facility as security risk. Nuclear security is not an issue where the president should lead from behind. In the case of a nuclear accident here or any other country, you can be sure the government and nuclear power industry reaction will be mirrors Japan's. They will control all information and access to the nuclear site, claiming national security concerns. The right to keep information from the public after disaster must be a privilege for the government, not an expectation. We need to establish now what level, level of access is necessary for scientists, reporters, what level of government discretion is necessary for national security. We need a framework for this agreement. For now, this burden lies with investigators, and we are not well organized. Even outside of disaster scenario, there is no link between scientists and the politicians. This is true here in the United States too. I was shocked to learn in the past two years how much trouble our top scientists have when contacting senators and congressmen. I didn't find this to be the case 20 years ago. Con continuous and open line communication between independent scientists, engineers, journalists, politicians is essential to handling another nuclear disaster effectively. I would like to ask all of you to persuade your government to share with the Japanese government your concern with the potential catastrophe and its international security and health issues. I conclude with three proposals for international action. Fact-finding mission to Fukushima made up of a select group of lawmakers 
from the United States, Russia, Ukraine, Germany, England, France, and Canada. Senator Wyden of Oregon set an example by visiting last year. Number two. <laughs> Special program established by UNICEF and the WHO to take extra measures to save the children who are being continually exposed to radiation in coming decades. Number three, mechanism for nuclear scientists and medical doctors to collaborate and develop new technology and medicine to treat illnesses association, associated with radiation exposures. When Prince Charles of England spoke last year at the Rio Plus 20 conference, he said with regard to climate change, it is perhaps a trait of human nature to act only when the worst happens. But that is not a trait we can afford to rely on here. He could have been speaking about Fukushima. I will continue to write my blog as a layman with my partner, Chris Cote, excellent man, young man I never met. And I again praise Helen and the New York Academy of Medicine for coordinating this event. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>